I've remained, you know, um, available to the brothers uh, and the sisters if they need anything from me. Um, and, and the main reason why is that I really believe in and I love the short-term and the long-term vision of YM. In short term, it's very simple. Anyone who's familiar with YM is familiar with the NeighborNet system that every week uh, throughout the country in so many neighborhoods, right here in Dallas in places like Richardson, Frisco, parts of Plano, uh, Euless, Irving, Valley Ranch, in all these areas, Muslim youth know that at least once a week, there's a place that I can go where I'm going to get my weekly dose of brotherhood or sisterhood we're going to have our activities, we're going to hang out, we're going to have a good time, but everything that we do will be centered around the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the short-term goal is inviting our youth, and I would say saving our youth from the fitna of society, giving them an excuse to at least save themselves once a week from the fitna of society and spend time with their brothers or their sisters. And the long-term vision, and this is what is much more meaningful to me now, looking back, the long-term vision of YM is to take these youth, many of these young brothers and sisters who you see who are organizing the program or who are sitting amongst us, the goal is to turn them into lifelong Islamic workers. A lifelong Islamic worker is someone who dedicates their life to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to serving humanity, for the sake of Allah. That doesn't mean they neglect their family. That doesn't mean they don't go to school. That doesn't mean they don't get a job. It means that with the same seriousness that they serve their family and they serve their employer, they take the same level of seriousness to serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with the topic that I've been given, referring to the roots of Islam in this country. And we have to be, I mean, we all know the roots of Islam in this country lie in the African-American community. If we want to go all the, all the way back to uh, even prior to the transatlantic slave trade, we know that sujood was made in the Americas prior to Columbus ever landing here. We know that during the transatlantic slave trade, a significant amount of the slaves who were brought over were Muslim. Many of them were even scholars of Islam. Some were people of great uh, knowledge. But more specifically, talking about the era of revival of Islam in America, in the 1960s and the 1970s, all the way till today, where African Americans flocked to Islam and embraced Islam as something that was truly theirs. And they established the foundations of Islam in America one that we cannot truly appreciate what we have unless we understand and appreciate the work that they, that they did. We ask that Allah accept from them. I mean, and connecting this back to YM, the uh, concept of being a lifelong Islamic worker, this is something that we can draw a lot of inspiration and lessons from that community of people, from those African-American Muslims who uh, owned Islam and made Islam theirs and established it in their communities throughout the United States. There's two particular qualities of an, of an Islamic worker that I think we can understand very well if we reflect on the African-American Muslim community. And those two qualities are, one is ikhlas. Ikhlas meaning, and I'm referring to both a sincerity as well as a level of seriousness with our commitment to Islamic work. What I mean by that is a lot of times, and we can use YM as an example, we can use the masjid as an example, we can use MSA, we can use any Islamic organization, charity organization, or anything like that. If you volunteer and you're part of a, a, a group, a, a, an Islamic organization, taking YM for example, right? We have Awab over here who's uh, walking around uh, controlling things. He is the sub-regional coordinator. He's in charge of YM brothers in, in Dallas area. He has to commit himself to a level of seriousness. He may have family responsibilities. He may have school. He may have work. He can't really slack off at work or he might get fired. He can't slack off with his family or his family might suffer. So at the same time, if he neglects his YM responsibilities, if he has ikhlas, 
He can't say, I don't have time for this right now. I got other things to do. Or I'll do it later. Or just delay, 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 and then do a sloppy job. I'm using, I'm using that role as an example. The same seriousness that you have with your commitments to work and to your family, you give that same level of seriousness to your Islamic work as well. It's not a passion project. It's not a hobby. This is something that we're working on for the sake of Allah. And our reward is with Allah. So just like our employer or our family will not tolerate an excuse from us when we neglect our responsibilities, we know that we will not uh, make those same excuses when it comes to the Islamic work. That is what I mean by ikhlas. And then the other, the other concept of the Islamic worker uh, that I think is very important is the concept of ihsan or khidmah, meaning serving humanity for the sake of Allah. And let's take a look at both of these, uh, both of these qualities through the example of the African-American Muslim community. Uh, one of the things that I'm very grateful for that Allah placed in my life was YM. I feel like it saved me throughout my teenage years from a lot of bad decisions, a lot of opportunities to get involved in things I had no business being involved in. And that is only from the mercy of Allah and nothing, no credit to my own. It is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the other thing that I'm very grateful for is having certain mentors and teachers who have taught me both of these qualities, ikhlas and ihsan, not just by our studies, not just by reading, but by observing their example and seeing them embody these qualities. I think that's the difference between a teacher and a mentor. I mean, you can't really teach sincerity on a PowerPoint or through a book or through a book club. Sincerity is taught, ikhlas is taught when you actually see the person acting it out. You know, some of my people who I've taken as mentors, one of my mentors is Imam Khalid Griggs, who was part of the Islamic party in North America. It was one of the earliest organized da'wah and social justice Islamic movements in America, established in 1971. Thousands upon thousands of people uh, were introduced to Islam and embraced Islam through their da'wah efforts. They were around in the 1970s and the 80s in many of the major cities, including DC, New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia, in those, uh, in those areas, predominantly amongst the African-American community. I've also had the privilege of learning under brothers who were part of Darul Islam, which was a similar da'wah movement, a little bit more, um, I don't want to say militant, but a little bit more aggressive. Uh, it was, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, so it was, it was okay uh, for Muslims to, to, to conduct themselves that way. Um, and then also, obviously, the, from the former nation of Islam, but the, when the organization was brought closer to Orthodox Islam under the leadership of Imam Warafdin Muhammad, I've had the privilege of being taught by and mentored by many of the Imams from those communities. Let me explain to you one example. You know, when it comes to sincerity, it's not just about, I'm going to go and do the work. It's also about the constructive work that we do. That if I want to serve Allah, see, if I want a job, if I want to become an engineer or a lawyer, I have to go to school. I have to hone those skills so that I can gain employment or establish a business using those skills. Similarly, if we want to serve Allah and we want to serve the community for the sake of Allah, through da'wah, or through, uh, you know, perhaps providing services to the needy community. Then ikhlas, sincerity requires that we give the same level of training. We gain that specialized training and those knowledge and those skills and that experience so that we can provide a more constructive service to the community. I think that serving food to the homeless or giving, uh, you know, uh, supplies to the homeless I think that's a very admirable quality. I admire that the Muslim community is involved in that. But what level of training or knowledge or skills does that require? Our children can do that type of stuff. So while I'm not saying that that is uh, not something we should be doing, what I am saying is that is not the end goal. Some of the brothers from YM were putting together these homeless bags to go and give to the homeless. And I remember I, I participated in this program and I said, guys, We've been doing this for 20 years. This is not going to solve the homelessness problem. If we really want to do something about it, you all, I've literally seen you all, all of us, myself included, 
We've gone to college. We got jobs. We gained specialized training so that we could get a level of income. If we really care about the homeless people, then let's gain some sort of specialized knowledge and training and implement a, a, a more constructive solution that can get us closer to ending this homelessness problem. See what I mean? You put a lot more uh, effort into it. And that's one of the lessons that I learned from the Islamic party in North America, that this is the Islamic worker will only get so much work done if we work by ourselves. To, and I'm picking on YM, right? But if you look at YM, any one of these members from the brothers or the sisters, how much work could they have gotten done by themselves? Very little. But because they've organized themselves into a jama'ah, following the sunnah of the prophets of Allah they've organized themselves into a jama'ah, they've brought their skills and their knowledge together, they're able to serve the community together. So similarly, I learned that from the African-American Muslim community, in some of these early Islamic movements, their commitment was that they were a jama'ah, they were working together, and they came and they pooled their skills and their resources. And their leadership had the foresight to say, this person, these people, you know, these guys, they are uh, former salespeople. We can leverage their skills in the street down. This person is a lawyer or has a background in advocacy. We can leverage their skills in some of the lobbying efforts that we need to do. And they fought against slum lords and these, these owners of these gigantic apartment buildings in the Northeast. You know, those big buildings that have thousands of people living inside them and there's roaches all over the place and the heat doesn't work in the, in the freezing cold winters. They took the, the, those of their members who had skills in law and in advocacy and they went and they fought for those people who were living inside those, those apartment complexes in the slums. That was their form of da'wah. That we're not just here to tell you about Islam. We are here to improve your quality of life. And if you like what we're about, Islam is what we're about. And we look at our community today. We look at the masajid today. We have a lot to be grateful for. We, I mean, I was just thinking earlier today, if we think back to the last Ramadan that just passed, throughout the entire Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, every masjid fundraiser, every Islamic organization fundraiser, every youth group fundraiser, every Islamic charity fundraiser, I don't know if anyone ever sat there and calculated how much money was raised from the Muslim community throughout all of DFW. It probably had to be in the tens of millions of dollars. I'm, I'm pretty sure just the few fundraisers that I went to, I'm pretty sure I, in my presence, over like $3 million was collected. It had to be a lot. I'm thinking back to these brothers and these sisters in the 1970s, these 20 something year olds who came from the Jim Crow South, who embraced Islam as this invitation, this liberating force. And then they came together and they said, we want to take the message of Islam to the people, but we need funding. Where's the money gonna come from? I'm 20 something years old, I've got kids. How am I gonna support my family? They came together and this is so mind blowing. The same people who were required to do street da'wah four days a week, the same people who were required to go into various areas and do advocacy and social justice work three or four days a week. Each and every single member was required to drive the organization's taxi cab at least twice a week. They opened a restaurant and each and every single member of the organization was required to go in the back and prepare food at least once or twice a week. They had stores. And these people were required, the members were required to go and man the stores, you know, stock the shelves, handle the cash register, because that was the way that they gained their revenue. Can you imagine if our masjid imams or our youth directors or our brothers and sisters in YM had to do DoorDash or Uber Eats so that they could fund their organization? Alhamdulillah, we should be grateful that Allah has blessed us as a community to be able to fund our organizations so that our scholars and our Islamic workers, many of them can have the, the privilege 
of serving the community full time. And we can have the privilege as donors of being a part of those efforts. That speaks to the sincerity. You must really believe in a cause if you are willing to drive a cab two nights a week so that you can continue the dawah efforts on the streets of Washington, D.C. and New York City. That is a different level of commitment. And every single member, every single morning before Salat al-Fajr and after Salat al-Fajr was required to go through their Islamic studies as a jama'ah. These were African-American Muslims. Many of them embraced Islam when they were 20 something years old. They had to unlearn so much stuff in their life and relearn certain things or learn some things brand new. They're learning a brand new way of life. Yes, it is Islam. It is the correct way of life. It is in their fitrah. But that is a very hard learning curve. To change the way that you use the bathroom every single day. To change the things that you eat every single day. Change the relationships that you have with your family. You can't go hug your cousins and stuff like that anymore. There's certain things that you have to change. They went through that because that was their commitment to Islam. That is ikhlas. That is not something that we learn just by reading. Yes, we learn ikhlas through reading about the life of the Prophet ﷺ and reading the Qur'an. But it takes mentors and role models and examples in the community that we can look to and say, that is ikhlas. May Allah accept from them. Remember, this was a time before you can live stream everything on your phone. Oh, hold on, hold on. He's about to take shahada. Let me live stream this real quick. That didn't happen. Just came back and said, Alhamdulillah, we got a few shahadas today. May Allah guide them. Here he is. Introduce the brother to the jama'ah. Bring him in. Introduce the sister to the jama'ah. Bring her in. Sincerity, ikhlas, uh, sincerity and seriousness is a very important part of our Islamic work. And that's something that we learn. Uh, through the example of the black Muslim community. Uh, prior to moving to Dallas, I spent my entire life in Houston. And while I was in Houston, I, I became involved with a community. Um, it is one of the roughest parts of Houston. Most impoverished, crime-ridden community in Houston is called uh, Fifth Ward. Mostly black and Latino, way under the poverty line. Median income, I think, is like 20 grand, something like that. It's a It's a very, very uh, depressed area. And there was an Imam, a very, uh, uh, he was popular, his name is Imam Qasim. He came from the Imam Warafdi Muhammad movement, former nation of Islam. He could have been an Imam anywhere. He's a great fundraiser, right? So he raised the seed money. And of all the places he could have gone to, he went to this depressed neighborhood, bought an old abandoned foreclosed church and made that the masjid and serve the community. And I've learned so many things just being with him, walking uh, you know, by his side through the streets of Fifth Ward. I have never seen an Imam, I have never seen an Imam walk the streets of a depressed neighborhood that is adjacent to his masjid. And as he's giving street dawah and inviting people to collect groceries at the, at the masjid, but he's also giving dawah to the people. He saw a woman who was in the business of selling herself. And she looked at him and she was interested in what, what are you here to do? What are you, uh, you know, what, what are these flyers in your hand? He saw her and he stopped in his tracks. And I'm walking by him, I keep walking, so what did we stop for? And I look back, and he's a tall guy, like 6'3". And I look at his face, and he has tears streaming down his face. And he looks at this woman, and he says, you are young enough to be my daughter. You don't need to do this. And he was looking around to see if, if we had a coat or something, because it was winter. He was trying to find a coat or something to cover up this, this young lady. And he tells her, sister, you don't need to do this. You don't need to do this. You will gain. Allah has given you so much more dignity. I've never seen an imam break down in tears like that, walking the streets of this community. And when I asked him later on, what was that all about? He said, I said what it was all about. When I saw her, I didn't see some kafir lady in the street. I saw my own child. 
I saw my own people. He said, these are my people. And Islam came to uplift their quality of life. Islam came to restore the dignity that Allah had given them, that the society has taken away from them to the point that she thinks the only way that she can get by is by doing that. Those types of experiences have taught me what an Islamic worker is. And those types of experiences have taught me that if we want to learn ikhlas, we want to learn the most critical part of being a lifelong servant of Allah, we have to look at this beautiful community that Allah placed before the larger Muslim community uh, you know, rise, uh, rose up and we were given all these resources. They did that for so long. The other aspect of Islamic worker with the time that I have remaining, I mentioned was ihsan or khidmah, serving humanity for the sake of Allah. You know, when I talk about being an Islamic worker, it's important for us to look at the passion and the skills and the qualities and the training that we have. You know, we have many uh, brothers and sisters who are doctors and they take their free time that they can that they can set aside, not just free time. I've seen many doctors, mashallah, take away their working hours to go and provide uh, free, uh, you know, uh, medical services to certain communities. I saw it myself, actually, mashallah, some brothers and sisters from, uh, from the Plano area, from around here. Uh, they went down to Oak Cliff. They went to a school with, uh, they went with the ICNA Relief, um, you know, the, the uh, free medical services team. They went into a, into a school, a, a middle school, with 700 kids in Oak Cliff who live in low-income housing projects. And they gave these 700 kids, for many of them, the very first eye exam that they ever had. Out of those 700 kids, over 50 of them, between the ages of 11 and 13, never knew they needed glasses. So we have, you know, some beautiful Muslim brothers and sisters who have taken their their skills and their training and given their time and their services to the sake of Allah. And we ask that Allah accept from them. I mean, we ask that Allah accept from all of us. But you know, sometimes when it comes to Islamic work, it is not just about our skills and our passion. It's also about what does the community need? In the 1960s or 1970s, after Malcolm X passed away, there was this generation of civil rights activists that came up. And one of those was a charming, handsome, young black man by the name of H. Rap Brown from right over here in Louisiana. If you go listen to his speeches, he was one of the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And he was part of the Black Panthers, this alliance that they had. If you look at his speeches, he was the type of guy that would just rile you up, fire you up to go and fight the power. And he was a dangerous guy for that reason. But it wasn't just his oratory skills on the mic. His ability was very unique. He could go into any community and he could mobilize and organize and fire up people who did not want to be fired up. You know, in the South in the 1970s, in Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, uh, the police would look the other way when the racist groups like the KKK and the white supremacists would go and attack uppity black people. And so for that reason, like there was a guy named Metgar Evers, peaceful NAACP organizer, shot dead on the street in, on his driveway in, the, in front of his house in Jackson, Mississippi. Shot dead and the police knew about it. The FBI were down the street. This is, this is public record, right? They looked the other way. So people, naturally African-Americans were afraid to protest. H. Rap Brown didn't care. He would go into these neighborhoods. He would do, he would organize uh, labor unions. He would organize student unions. He would organize church groups. And he would get people who were afraid to go and fight the power to go and fight the power. He was dangerous in Alabama, which means he was nuclear in Chicago and New York, where those limitations did not happen. It was so bad. The government feared him so much that the U.S. government passed a law called the H. Rap Brown Law, went through the House of Representatives, approved by the Senate, written into law by the president, named after H. Rap Brown, 
made it a federal crime if you cross state lines and incite a riot, that is a federal crime. He ended up going to jail. I think it was 1971, goes to jail in Rikers Island. Political crime. And that is where the whole story twisted. Allah opened his heart to Islam. And now when he comes out, he has the same fire, but now he has tawakkul. Now he knows victories with Allah, and I no longer have to hold the burden of victory. Now I'm going to go and fight for the sake of Allah. And now I have the principles. For seven years he studied the Qur'an in Rikers Island. For seven years he studied the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. Taught himself Arabic in Rikers Island. We have seminaries where our students, our young people go to study Arabic today. He studied Arabic in Rikers Island, the most vicious prison in America. And of all the neighborhoods that he could have chosen, he went to the west end of Atlanta, called the Million Dollar Block, because millions of dollars worth of drugs were sold on that block. Goes into that neighborhood and says, there's a new sheriff in town. The drug dealers, the gangsters, the white uh, gangs, the black gangs, the Latino gangs, everybody said, you know, this guy is different. This guy is not like the others. He's not going to call the cops on us. He has a team of Muslims in his masjid, and they're much more dangerous. From that moment on, everybody knew. If you see a little boy in the street wearing a kufi, or a little girl in the street wearing a hijab, don't even think about going up to them. Matter of fact, you should help them carry their groceries if possible. And every evening between Asr and Maghrib, he, you, could, you knew where he was. He was sitting on his stool right in front of the masjid where he could see the whole intersection. That's where people would come to him for advice. That's where many of the shahadas took place. That's where some of the hardest drug dealers and gangsters embraced Islam. And it was dangerous for those who were against him. But I listened to, I was there three years ago when we had a rally in West End Park, and I heard Killer Mike, and I heard T.I., these rappers who grew up in that neighborhood said, this place was a war zone. But a community of black and brown Muslims saved this neighborhood. They raised our property values. They raised our school rankings. They made this neighborhood safe for not just Muslim kids, but everybody to play. T.I. said, that I wasn't allowed to go there and play basketball. But his mom said, oh, I think those Muslims are over there now. You should be able to go and play basketball over there now. That was his reputation. And they were after him for a long time. When they established the counterintelligence program, they wanted to, the FBI stated that they wanted to stop the rise of a black messiah. And one of the examples of the black messiah was H. Rap Brown, Imam Jamil al -Amin. And in 2000 or 2001, he was falsely convicted uh, for a crime he did not commit. Uh, and he has spent his life in prison. And we have, he's still in prison right now in a maximum facility prison, federal prison, even though he's a state prisoner. Um, five years he was blind until he got his cataract surgery. He's 80 years old, but his lawyer says he's still as sharp as they come. Now the interesting thing was, he had all these skills. He was able to use them to be the imam of a community, to clean up a neighborhood. I've been to the West End of Atlanta. I have seen a community of people who, know no, who have no religion, who have never known a religion other than Islam because their grandparents embraced Islam under the leadership and the da'wah of Imam Jamil Abdullah Al-Amin. May Allah accept from him, Amin. But when he's in prison, you know, this is... The, the, the Islamic worker has to be able to adapt. The, the terrain might change. Allah will throw you into a predicament where, hey, you know, your knowledge and your skills, they're no longer that useful. What are you going to do now? He's being held in solitary confinement. This was such a mind-blowing story. I had to talk to two or three people to verify that this is true. He's in 23-hour lockdown, has no access to anybody else. He cannot talk to anybody else. What's he going to do? He's sitting there, he's sitting there. You know, there's a prison guard right in front of his door. He starts talking to the prison guard. A couple days later, the prison guard takes shahada. 
They say, okay, then remove the black guard. Get, put a white guard over there. A couple days go by, the white guard takes his shahada. All right. No more talking to this prisoner, all right? If you talk to this prisoner, you're fired. All right. Allah changes the, the situation on him again. But the Islamic worker has sincerity and they have this drive to serve Allah no matter what the situation is. And the Islamic worker is creative. He has ingenuity. She has ingenuity. He discovers there is a way I can communicate with the person right next door. I'm not sure how, you know, because they're maximum security facility, speaking through the AC vent, yelling, I don't know. But here's the other predicament. He managed to start communicating with the guy next door, but the guy next door is the leader of the white supremacist gang in the prison. He hates black people. He hates Muslims. He really hates this guy, right? A few days go by and the chaplain of the prison gets a message from that white supremacist leader and says, my name is now Abdurrahman. I would like a prayer rug delivered to my, to my, my cell, please. The Islamic worker adjusts. When Allah puts us in a position where what are you going to do now? How are you going to serve Allah? The Islamic worker says, I'm going to develop my skills. What if I get fired from my job? What if I need to change my career? I'm going to switch up. I'm going to make the necessary changes. How many times has Allah thrown something in our family? You know, I've seen so many families where they dream of having a child who's going to be healthy. But the child is born with a very difficult disease. And the parents have to literally change overnight. And they now have to adjust to this a disability that their child has. As an Islamic worker, we have to take that same level of commitment. Allah has changed things up on me. I got to do something about it. And in the context of us as a community, in terms of our young people, our young Muslims, our MSA members, our masjid youth groups, we have to also, we have to look to our skills. We have to look to our passion. We have to develop the skills, uh, you know, to be able to serve Allah. But we have to look at the community that we're dealing with. We have to look at the situation that Allah has placed us in. You know, I absolutely admire and love the fact that we have this aura of scholarship in our community. I was sitting down with a group of young people, younger than me, right? About 10 of them. And they're beautiful young brothers. And I'm talking to them and I say, so what do you all want to do, you know, with your life? I want to be a scholar. I want to be a scholar. I, I mean, they're all saying, I want to be a scholar. Ten of them say they want to be scholars. They want to dedicate their life to learning and teaching. And I said, that's awesome, man. We need scholars. We desperately need scholars. It may not look like it in Dallas, right? Because we have, we have an abundance, alhamdulillah. But there's, we need ulama. I, I know people who go to some very dubious sources for their Islamic teachings, right? So we need good, authentic knowledge. But guys, there's 10 of you over here. Do all 10 of you have to become scholars and sit in the masjid and teach? I mean, we have other things that we need done as well. I'm wearing a shirt that says Muslims for Oak Cliff. Our vision that we were working on for many years, Alhamdulillah, Allah, you know, rewarded us for our patience and our commitment to, to the effort. And just last month, we opened a community center in Oak Cliff in a very, very difficult neighborhood of Oak Cliff on Sunnyvale and Overton, 75216, highest incarceration rate per capita in the state of Texas, being led by uh, a, a brother, a uh, half black, half Latino brother who's from Oak Cliff, who's done time, who knows the community, and he's over there. And we're working with him. Many of the YM brothers have come. ICNA has, a, uh, has an entire uh, department that's dedicated to this. The ICNA Council for Social Justice, Muslim Alliance for Black Lives, ICNA Relief has been helping out. We are starting a, a food pantry. But we got a lot of work to do in that neighborhood. And I'll leave you with this because my time is up. This is the predicament that we are in. That's Southern Dallas. If we get in our car, that's 25 minutes from here. I think about 20 miles. Take 75 all the way down, take exit Overton, keep on going till you hit Sunnyvale. Keep going into that neighborhood where you have to lock your doors and pull up your windows 
turn into that neighborhood where you hear the music blasting because right next to us is a record shop and sometimes he needs to be reminded to put the, the volume down. You're going to smell something that smells like some herbs, but we're in that neighborhood, right? And this is the predicament that we as a community are in. We have more people saying, I would like to learn about Islam, than we have people who are there to say, I will help guide you in your journey of Islam. So we ask that Allah blesses our community with these two very fundamental uh, qualities, sincerity, ikhlas, and ihsan, the ability to do good deeds. If there's anything I said that was good, it was from the guidance of Allah. If there's anything, anything I said that was wrong, or my apologies for going over, I ask Allah for forgiveness. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum.